Well, to put uh, this report in context, six years ago, this, uh, the November forecast uh, with which I took office, the projection was for a $6.2 billion deficit in the next biennium. We owed $2 billion to their schools, and there are numerous other shifts and gimmicks woven into the budget. Now we have a projected $1.4 billion surplus for the next biennium. We owe nothing to the schools. $1.9 billion parked in the budget and reserve fund and it's just a, a, a remarkable change from chronic deficits to a, 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 a secure budget, fiscal integrity for the state, honest budgeting, and the like. Uh, what this forecast says to me is that we're in a time of continued economic insecurity. Uh, this obviously, uh, these projections occur before the election and nobody knows what those impacts are going to be. We'll have a better idea in the, uh, at the end of the February, forecast at the end of February. But uh, to me, it means we need to be cautious and prudent and uh, recognize that our economic growth is constrained by the national economic growth, which uh, the forecast here is for continued uh, growth, but a lesser uh, level than previously forecasted. And also our the ceiling in our labor force, which is really impacting businesses that want to expand, and uh, there's just not uh, the workers available to do so. So those are gonna be our constraints uh, under what are really the, the best of reasonable circumstances. This does not factor in the possibility of a recession, doesn't factor in the possibility of some other uh, serious economic dislocation. We obviously have both in our steel industry and our agriculture industry, uh, those sectors of our economy in Minnesota uh, need to do whatever we can, but frankly, the federal government is really gonna be the impetus for the kind of recovery necessary in those two sectors. So. Uh, the things we, we can and will do in, within the state level, uh, but we're also going to need some cooperative action in Washington. I'd be glad there's some other questions. So as you sketch out your budget, what does this forecast say that you can, can and can't spend money on? What does it say about tax cuts? Address the specific... Well, that's, that's the assessment we'll have to start to make. Uh, Myron's a very good poker player. I didn't have an inkling. Uh, uh, what this is going to be. I mean, it's a, it's about, uh, you know, steady as it goes. But I, I haven't factored in. We're just starting the process of our, in our uh, office of, of looking at the options. But there will obviously be uh, very real constraints here, uh, given the spending needs that I've already seen uh, that others have, and most of them very legitimate as well as uh, the tax side. So we'll have to figure out how to balance that out as, as well as the legislature. Does this make... Well, uh, we're gonna have a meeting this afternoon of uh, the leaders of the four caucuses and Lieutenant Governor and myself. My position is I'm uh, still waiting to get back from uh, the House Re Republican caucus or and maybe the Senate uh, caucus, Republican caucus as well, what, what, the, what the, uh, they agreed to my proposal. Uh, they want to add to it. Uh, the speakers talked about accessibility as some feature there. I'm totally in favor of whatever we do to provide continuity of care for, for people, but we don't know at this point, from what I'm told, uh, whether that's viable or not with the health plans. So we need to get that piece of it settled. Uh, that's the basis for a special session as far as I'm concerned. And until we get that, that piece in place and, and secure, then the rest of it's just speculation. We'll just have to see. Governor, do you think uh, the budget forecast today is going to make it harder or easier for you to strike a deal on the budget with the Republican-controlled legislature next spring? <laughs> if I had that kind of crystal ball, I would... Uh, Life would be much, much easier. I, I don't know. I, 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 you know. I know there are a lot of new legislators, but I, I think most of them were in Minnesota in 2011. Certainly the legislators who were here uh, have, I expect, vivid memories, as I do, of uh, the 
the enormous trauma we caused to Minnesotans by the inability to reach a, 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 a agree upon a budget and the shutdown that followed. I just I hope that we will all take note, note of that uh, when we get to the final uh, decision making at the end of May. Your budget commissioner urges caution as, as legislators here enter the, the budget setting year. Um, you know, but your response, how ambitious might you be in your proposal in the face of the economic outlook? Well, uh, I'm constrained within this uh, forecast. You know, we'll see if anything changes in, at the end of February, but my budget is due January 24th, and uh, obviously we'll have to operate within uh, this budget constraint. And again, I haven't gone into looking at particular uh, proposals for spending needs. Uh, personal care attendants uh, met with them this last week, their need for a, a better income. And, you know, there are a whole number of other, you know, what I consider to be very good causes uh, that, that great, total up, uh, I can see already, greatly exceed what we have available. And then you have the tax side as well. So, uh, you know, again, that's the part we'll have to be working on for the next six weeks is to compress all of that into, into a budget that fits within this, uh, these constraints. Healthcare spending decreases. People on social media are already saying this means the Affordable Care Act is affordable and it's working. Is there a relation in your mind? Well, I, I'm not. You know, uh, Ms. Kelly could speak more authoritatively than I. There was a shift of funds spending from the general fund to the healthcare access fund for some of the healthcare expenditures, which had the effect of reducing the general fund spending for health care. So I, I, I don't know, know that it's uh, an apples, it's not an apples to apples comparison. I don't know that the Affordable Care Act is so much a factor as it was the Medicaid and people uh, who were covered there, which 90% uh, of which is paid for by the federal government. You know, we're, we're, we're going to hit a serious crunch with the health care access fund when the provider tax expires at the end of 2019, and all the people that now depend on Minnesota Care will be, uh, you know, put at, at serious risk. But that's that's down the road. What? How many people are as a result of what the ever changes uh, they're going to make in Washington to the Affordable Care Act, and the timing of that is very uncertain at this point. Uh, but if that has the effect also of, of pushing people off of uh, private insurance to um, the public programs, that will have an impact too. So I, th I think uh, for me, the Healthcare Access Fund is, is uh, you know, wait and see and be very cautious about impacting it uh, until we know better from what's coming down from Washington. How do you handle that, Governor? Do you just leave more money on the bottom line in case whatever happens out there costs the state more? How do you deal with the changes? Well, uh, that's. We're going to have to factor that in. You know, we're all dealing with that that great great uncertainty. Uh, it's certainly something you'll take into account. You know, our this forecast is based on current law, federal law, and state law. I mean, my budget is due four days after the new administration begins, so I don't expect you know, you're here one day after another all the rhetoric. But I also know that Congress is not. Is not as immediately uh, agile as the Minnesota legislature, which is to the great credit of the Minnesota legislature. But uh, as they said to me when I was told it was going to take, when I arrived in the Senate in 2001 and they, they said uh, it's going to take, this is your temporary seat in the chamber. I said, well, how long is it going to take? Because I was 100 of the seniority. How long is it going to take for the other 99 senators to decide where they want to sit in these identical desks? And she said, well, they like to ponder those things. <laughs> so uh, they'll be pondering out there for a while. We'll just have to, you know, we'll just have to, you know, a five-month session, we're just going to have to recognize that they, whatever changes they make are going to impact us uh, from every which way are ones that we're going to have to factor into the, the overall equation. For tax cuts, in light of a surplus, I, I can predict there's going to be some people who are going to say it's the people's money, give it back to them. Well, I think you know, we, you know, tax cuts, we, of course, we have the tax cut possibility for uh, the special session if we can resolve the health care premium 
and do what we need to do to help the 125,000 Minnesotans who are needing a health care premium relief. So that's, that's my priority number one and a prerequisite for uh, a special session. Beyond that, we'll see, and then beyond that next year, we'll see again. I'm not going to, uh, re re for the health care premiums? No, just a, a give it back, a la Jesse Chaffee. Well, you know, we, we gave it, they gave it back in 2000, 2001, and you can see the, the deficit situation for the state that followed. I mean, give it all back is, is really, uh, frankly, a misnomer. We have the surplus we have because we have the change in fiscal policy because we raised taxes on the wealthiest 2% not on anybody else, and because we had a good economic recovery. So, you know, the, nobody's paying a higher tax rate, except for the top 2%, nobody's paying a higher tax rate uh, for the state income tax than they were before I took office. You know, so whatever additional revenue is not from raising taxes on 98% of the people in Minnesota, it's from economic growth. And then, the, as I say, about $1.5 billion comes from taxing the, the top 2%. So if you really, you know, get beyond the rhetoric and look at the, the facts of it, you know, we, we, we again, gone from chronic deficits to uh, so far uh, sustained surpluses. And that's something that I intend to protect. Don't just let the market play out. I mean, we, we, I think we had a significant impact with what we did with uh, Congressman Nolan and others in the congressional delegation and so forth with uh, the uh, situation with the steel industry and, and uh, you know, they credit uh, Cleveland Cliffs credits that for their renewed uh, uh, employment back uh, there and the like. We're trying to get the SR project extracted from uh, the bankruptcy proceedings and, and make that uh, available to Cliffs or someone else to move ahead and, and reemploy people there. So, uh, the, you know, those are the kind of steps that we are certainly taking. We'll continue. The agriculture, I, I frankly don't know what we can do to influence uh, commodity prices. It's part of a you know, national and really a global economic uh, interdependency. We've got a record, uh, uh, record uh, crops this year in Minnesota and elsewhere. And basic law of supply and demand, that means prices are, are uh, extremely low. So how we rectify that, we can do more with uh, biofuels, certainly look at that. Uh, and also look at what we can do for encourage uh, export of Minnesota commodities. But ultimately, the, uh, you know, the farm bill there will have, have much more of an effect and has much more money involved in it than anything we could afford. Other property tax relief, I was going to just say. You know, the property tax, uh, you know, lags the, the, the ag agricultural cycle. So people, when they're low prices, uh, the, their property taxes are still high relative to their incomes. So that's something that I very want, to, well, want very much to look at. That would be a, a top priority for tax, tax relief. Any other questions? Got a whole lineup of people here. I hope, uh, the, I hope you guys brought lunch. <laughs> Thank you very much.